I ran some benchmarks on iterators versus materialized collections and the results were shocking. Okay, but in all seriousness, some of the results were exactly as I expected, but actually I was pretty surprised by some of the other results that I saw in the output. If you haven't checked out my video that compares iterators, materialized collections, and the pitfalls that they both have that I've seen in production code, stay right to the end because you'll want to check that out for more context. So before I walk us through the benchmark setup and the benchmark output, I want to hear from you in the comments what your thoughts thoughts are about iterators versus materialized collections and what their performance characteristics are going to look like. And without wasting any more time, let's just jump right into the code. All right, I have the all about enumerables solution pulled up from the dev leader GitHub repository. I'll have a link for that in the description. So if you want to go check it out, clone it, run the code yourself, you're welcome to go do that. And really, I wanted to be able to put this together because I was following up on some of the other content I was creating where I was looking at iterators and materialized collections and actually some of the challenges that you can encounter with both of these. But full disclaimer, in my own personal and professional use, I almost always stick to having a streaming iterator-based API. In my experience, based on the trade-offs that I've seen in production code, having a streaming API leveraging iterators has led to more flexible usage of APIs. Of course, I'm not saying it's perfect, but this is the pattern that I've generally stuck to. When I put these benchmarks together, I was very confident that I was going to see a particular output. And when I was looking through the results, I did confirm what I expected to see, which was great. It was a nice little confidence boost. However, there was one characteristic that I was extremely surprised about legitimately, and I want to be able to walk through these examples and then go through the output so that you can see what I saw. So let's go ahead and scroll through what we have going on here. If you're not familiar with it, I am using benchmark.net. In my opinion, it's an awesome way to set up benchmarks that you can keep rerunning. It's highly configurable and even takes care of things like warm-up runs, so you don't have to worry so much about consistency if you have a one-off thing that just seem to perform better when you ran a benchmark. All right, so I'm using top level statements here and you can see that there's no program class. I just have the actual code kind of starting off here. So I do have a configuration here that I'm creating for benchmark.net. And then basically I'm going to be just running the benchmarks that I have and the benchmarks are a class that you can see below right here. I just have this little check here that runs after because I've seen particular cases where the benchmark ends up finishing really quick and it's because there was actually an error in how I configured it and then it looks like it succeeded but there was actually nothing run. So the more interesting part is actually this benchmark class. Just to call it out I am going to be using .NET 7.0 and you can see that I just have the benchmarks class flagged with that attribute. Now, the different scenarios we're going to be looking at are an iterator, we're going to be looking at a method that populates a list and returns a list, and then we're going to look at a very similar method, but the return type is not going to be a list, it will actually be an I read only collection. I added in this case after because I was speculating about some of the performance characteristics I was seeing between these two things. Next, I just have this configured to run a thousand, a hundred thousand, and ten million in terms of the size of the data set. And then this other property here is just such that it will iterate through the different types of implementations that I have. But benchmark.net will basically go through the permutations of these for me automatically. Next, you'll see that we have this setup. It's marked as global, so it's going to run once for the duration of the entire benchmark. And really, I'm just going to be creating an array called dataset. It's an array of integers, and I fill it with random numbers. And I've seeded it with this constant seed, just so that between runs... There's no variability. It's just one less thing for me to point at and say, I wonder if this was any different. In this particular case, I don't really think it matters. I'm just trying to practice doing that. Okay, the three different methods that we're going to be running are now on my screen. So you can see right here highlighted. The first one that we're going to have up here is the one that returns as a read-only collection. And you can see that it will populate a list right here. When it returns the results, the return type is I read only collection. The next one right below is almost the exact same. Literally the only difference is that the return type is a list of integers. And finally, the third one is similar, but it's an iterator. So instead of populating and materializing a list, we would actually just be iterating through. Okay, so let's look at the different scenarios that we're going to run against these three different methods. The first scenario that we're going to look at is actually just calling the link method any on the result of these functions. Next, we'll actually run the link count method on these. The third one we have here is calling to array, which is also a link extension method. What this one should be doing is actually making a copy of the result set and putting it into an array. An interesting variation of the previous one that I just wanted to experiment with was actually taking half of the size of the collection and then trying to copy that to an array using to array from link. 
Why did I do this? I was just kind of curious to see if there would be any different performance characteristics that we might be able to observe between this and the previous one. And finally, I'm just going to run a simple for each loop across these three different methods. You might be asking, why didn't I go with just a for loop with an index? And that's because with an iterator, I actually can't do that. So I just wanted to pick something that would be common across the three. All right, at this point, cue up your drum roll because I'm not going to make you sit through running these benchmarks. I already have that done. If you do try running this local you'll notice that it takes a few minutes. So instead of making you stare at a console, I will edit this video and we'll jump right to the results now. So if you've never seen the output from benchmark.net dropped into the console like this, it's nice and colorful. There's a ton of columns with a ton of numbers. So let's walk through it slowly to see what we have going on here. The first part of the table that's output here is going to be the for each test that we're going to be running across the three different scenarios. If we look over at the implementation column, I apologize, but the name that I chose to use in my enum does look pretty pretty messy, but this one that actually is trimmed is the one that has a read-only collection return type. And it's important to note that as we walk through these, you'll notice a similar pattern where we're going to be testing with a 1,000, 100,000, and 10 million result set, and then each of the different implementations kind of in the same order. So this will repeat as we go through, and all that's going to be changing, if you look at the left side, is the method that we're using. All right, so when we look at the first little sample that we have here, I'm looking at the mean column. And if we look at the performance characteristics, it looks like populate as list is actually the most performant. In fact, it's half the time that an iterator took. You'll also notice that it's significantly faster than when we returned as an I read only collection, which is very interesting. And I'll explain that in a moment. The other piece of data that I'm really interested in is actually this far right column that says allocated. And this is going to be the amount of memory that was allocated to run the scenario. So at a glance, we said that the I read only collection return type is definitely the slow and if we look far to the right, in terms of memory usage, it's right on par with the list example. So that means from an implementation perspective, if we're considering runtime performance and memory usage, right now we're kind of really just comparing the iterator versus the materialized list. So while the materialized list in this example was twice as fast as the iterator, it was two orders of magnitude more memory allocated. So right when I saw this first example, I was already pretty shocked because I totally expected that the memory allocated was going to be significantly better for the iterator than the list. However, the runtime performance when we look at the mean column is really what shocked me here. If we look a little bit lower at the larger data sets, the 100,000 count is actually kind of interesting because the iterator and list are actually quite comparable. If you look at the amount of memory allocated, the iterator still only allocates 48 bytes, but the list is allocating significantly more memory. Once we get up to a 10 million data set size, the list continues to outperform the iterator, but the amount of memory allocated just keeps ballooning while the iterator still remains under 100 bytes allocated. So why is the performance of that so shocking to me? And what do I think is actually happening here? Well, let's jump back to the code and I want to go look at the iterator implementation and the get results using list as list implementation. So like I said, the amount of memory allocated is not the thing that's surprising me here. It's the performance characteristics. When we look at the iterator, we have to go enumerate the entire data set and yield back each item. That's going to mean that when we have a 10 million data set size, we have to do 10 million iterations to return these back out. And because this is an iterator and we have a for each loop wrapping it, it kind of acts like a pipeline. So really you're only doing 10 million iterations in total. However, if we go look at the list implementation, this is going to explain why it's shocking to me. We basically still would have to do the same 10 million iterations even before we leave this method. And I'll say that again. We have to do 10 million iterations when the data set is 10 million items just to populate the list of results that we want to return. However, once we have that entirely new populated list that took 10 million iterations, we're going to go run a for each loop on that 10 million result set and do a another 10 million iterations. This will mean that in total for the list, we're going to do 20 million iterations and it's still more performant than the iterator. To me, that's completely baffling because we're doing twice as many iterations in total, but I think we have two things going on here. The first part is that iterators in general are less performant because of how they're structured with the yielding mechanism. In my opinion, I wouldn't think that alone is enough that it would be slower than when you're doubling up the total number of iterations. But I think the other thing that's going on here is that we have a 
little bit of magic going on with the list return type. In the latest versions of .NET, we're actually able to use for each loops on lists and arrays, and they're treated as read-only spans. And I think that's where we're getting an enormous performance boost, because when we're actually doing that outer for each loop, that's also going to be using a read-only span and going super fast. In the case of the iterator, for the outer for each loop, we're not going to have the luxury of using read-only spans because it only sees it as an I enumerable. And this is actually where I wanted to try proving my hypothesis by adding this other method that looks very similar but returns as an I read-only collection. The mechanism for using read-only spans as that performance optimization in for loops and for each loops works on lists and arrays. However, the return type here is an I read-only collection of ints. It is not a list and it's not an array. So if we jump back over to the numbers and we look and we compare the performance of the I read only collection return type versus the list, you can see that it's significantly faster when it's returned as a list. And I think that that's proving my hypothesis that it's able to use read only spans on the list return type, getting a huge performance boost when we compare it to the I read only collection return type. Now let's go ahead and start checking out the other methods that we wanted to exercise here. So something that's really powerful when we're contrasting the iterator approach versus the materialized collection approach is the link method any. If you've watched my other videos on this, I'm not suggesting that if you have code that's returning enormous data sets when you're accessing something like a database, that the only way to make that feel good is that you have to basically move to an iterator instead of materializing a collection, because you can absolutely make the argument that you should just reduce the size of the query and do paging or something like that. However, in practice, I often see that people are doing things like calling link methods like any count, other things like that. So my goal here is not to tell you that one is always better than the other. I just wanted to show you with some data points about how these behave. Okay, so the performance characteristics of the any link method are actually exactly what I would have expected. And that's because if we look at the iterator approach, it is always way faster than the other implementations. The reason that's the case is because it's using a streaming API, and as soon as it recognizes that it has a single item, it's able to terminate doing the iteration. But when you're materializing an entire list, you actually have to fully populate that list before you can even ask if it has anything in it. This is also illustrated if we look at the memory allocated column, because just to check if we have anything, in the results that are returned from those methods, both methods that have to fully populate a list allocate way more memory than the iterator does. So this one checks out for my expectations. The count method from the link namespace is also kind of interesting, and I think it's quite comparable to the for each example that we looked at in the beginning. As expected, the iterators don't allocate much memory at all, while the materialized collections, of course, have to make an entire copy of the data set and allocate way more memory. However, the runtime performance results for this were also a little bit surprising to me. When I think about the implementation of the iterator approach, Again, because it's like a streaming pipeline, I would have expected that it does one full enumeration and counts as it goes. And actually, in hindsight, I should have caught this about the list and I read only collection approaches, but I was thinking that it would have to do two full enumerations, one to populate the list, one to actually count through the list. But I totally forgot that the link implementation has an optimization for collections. And if those collections actually have a length or a count on them, it's able to use that and short circuit instead of actually doing an entire full enumeration of that data set. So yes, across the board, you will notice that the iterator is less performant than the list and the I read only collection return types. But given that they're very comparable in terms of runtime, if we're looking at the amount of memory allocated, I would say that the amount of memory allocated is a way bigger deal breaker when you're considering materializing an entire collection versus just being able to use an iterator. Now, I wanna to skip to the bottom one that actually calls to array from the link namespace before we go to the one right above that that does half to an array. So this example was interesting to me because in my head, I'm thinking that if we have an iterator or a materialized collection, we're going to be making an entire copy of that data set 
using toArray. This should imply that we essentially have to do a full enumeration of that data set and allocate that memory for the new collection. So yes, the iterators have been performing really well in terms of memory allocation, but this would be an example where we actually have to allocate a bunch of memory just for the result of what we're trying to perform over that iterator. And then again, my expectation here would have been that when we're using materialized collections and calling toArray, it would have to do an entire second enumeration over that materialized collection. If we jump over to the memory allocated, across the board when we're looking at iterators, they're always going to be allocating way less memory for this. And that's of course because inside the iterator itself, it is never materializing another additional collection whereas the other implementations have to materialize a full collection before even returning. And that part was totally as expected. The performance characteristics absolutely were not what I was expecting here. The iterator approach for the 1000 element dataset is three times as long to run as the other two. When we bump that up to 100,000 items, it is three times as long to run the iterator than the other two. And finally, when we're up at 10 million items, it's just less than twice the time it takes to run the other two. 100% not what I expected, and that's because, again, I was expecting that the amount of iterations we would have to do on the materialized collection implementations would be literally twice as many enumerations as with the iterator. And even if that is the case for how it's working under the hood, I think again we're getting lucky because the implementation of two array is probably heavily optimized for collections that already have memory allocated. In the case of the iterator, we're paying the performance hit of using the iterator in general to yield back items, but then we also have to go construct a collection. And because we don't actually know the entire size of the data set, I'm assuming that it's paying a performance penalty to keep resizing that collection to be able to fit the results of the iterator. All right, if we jump to the very last example that I want to talk through today and we look at the take half, so this is going to use the take link method to take 50% of the size of the collection and then call two array on that, we get an interesting blend of results here. The reason I wanted to implement this one and examine the characteristics of it is because I think that this type of thing, even though it might be a little bit contrived in terms of taking half, is actually a pattern that I see coming up a lot in real code. And that's actually that we get a materialized collection, then we're running link methods on it, and even though you had that materialized collection, once you start running link methods on it, you're now dealing with iterators again. Everything in Link is leveraging these streaming iterator APIs. And to kind of prove that to you, I think these results actually speak to that. You'll recall that when we called two array on the iterator, it was way less performant than the other two. But when we look at the take half and then call in two array, all of these perform roughly the same. If we look at the larger result sets, you'll notice that at 100,000 items, again, they're all almost the exact same in terms of runtime. Once we get up to about 10 million, then yes, we start to see the iterator pull ahead. And if we jump over to the memory allocated, across the board, we're always going to have the iterator allocating far less memory, but it still has to allocate some because the result of what we're doing is copying that output to an array. So again, to highlight why I think this one is interesting is even if you take into consideration all the other stuff that I was talking about in terms of, hey, look, it looks like using iterators is allocating less memory, but if you're going to be using a list, you're getting these performance boosts in some cases. Regardless of what you're doing, when you think about how people actually consume the API that you're creating, you might get completely different performance characteristics than you would have been expecting. So sure, you might jump right to, well, I guess that means we can't use any link, and I'm not here to tell you how to go design your code either. All that I'm trying to illustrate to you is that if you have use cases where your API is being consumed, and it was a materialized collection under the hood, and you were doing that for some performance benefits, if the other developers calling your API and up running link on the result of that, they're essentially just undermining a lot of the performance gains that you were trying to create. So in summary, we got to look at the performance characteristics and memory characteristics of using iterators versus materialized collections. When I was preparing for all of this, I went in super confidently that I was going to see iterators blow the performance and memory characteristics completely out of the water compared to materialized collections. However, yes, I was pleasantly surprised to know that I was right about the amount of memory that was allocated for iterators, but I was completely shocked about the performance characteristics when we looked at iterators and materialized collections.
Again, I'm not here to tell you that one is right and one is wrong. I'm just trying to provide you with some data so that you can design your software in a way that makes sense for you. Thanks so much for watching. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and of course, as promised for sticking right to the end, you can check out my other video about the pitfalls of both iterators and materialized collections by checking this out here.